Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Mumford. Um, my speech, if you will, is Ready for Anything, How to Build Your Superhero Squad. Let me adjust this real quick. Is that better? Yes? Cool. All right, and so uh, pretty much how to build your superhero squad and what it means to me. As uh, I grew up, I am the oldest of five kids. Uh, my sister is the youngest. I was born in 1979. She was born in 1985. My mom was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My dad, New York City. Uh, and this was during the tail end of uh, the civil rights movement in American, America's history. So they had a, a taste of the racial inequality that was plaguing our country at that time. So my parents decided to raise a family, not in the inner city, but in the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, as far off the grid as possible. Uh, the population was about 3,500, and I would say there were maybe a handful of minority families in the village. The cool part about Yellow Springs, Ohio, is that growing up, we never felt like we were different. We always felt that you know we belonged, and going through school was great. Um, never had any issues. My mom had instilled in us early on that she was a strong black woman and has had to do everything by herself. And as she taught us this, it became kind of ingrained in us that we too, as far as uh, myself and my siblings, we had to go through life and do it alone. We had to be hardcore. We had to be stoic. Uh, you couldn't rely on anybody. Um, what I've come to find out as life has gone on is that while you can achieve a certain level of greatness in life, in your own personal life, at some point you need others. You need to cultivate a team. You need to build a team that can help you manage life's ups and downs. So I turned uh, 17, did my senior year, graduated, and several days after I graduated, my mom and I made a mutual decision that I needed to hit the dusty trail. Uh, we were not getting along, we were fighting each other, and she said, I have four other kids after you, and I'm not doing this five times. So I'm like, okay. So my girlfriend and I at the time, we left Yellow Springs, Ohio, and went straight down to Virginia Beach. That's where her mom was at the time. And within three weeks, I realized I had made a grave mistake. Uh, not being with her, uh, but like, life is hard. Like, where does food come from? Who makes money? Like, how does all this work? Um, and my parents came down, my, my family came down to visit us in July. Uh, I, I found out years later that I wanted my mom to tell me I could go, I could come back home. And my mom wanted me to tell her that I wanted to go back home, but we never had that conversation. So my family left and I stayed in Virginia Beach for the next couple months. Um, my girlfriend and I found ourselves pregnant in August of uh, 1997. At that time, I decided to go into the military. There's me in my uh, picture going into basic training. And by, so I went into the military in September 1997. By uh, New Year's Day 1998, I was married. By March of 1998, we moved down to Fort Benning, Georgia. And April 1998, we welcomed our first son into the world. That's him over there. That's my oldest son, Justin. This is my youngest son, Davin. He is currently at Purdue at the School of Engineering right now, and he is in eighth grade. Uh, he's in his freshman year at um, uh, Purdue right now. He's doing really well. Um, my wife and I, we had some complications, if you will. So we decided that I should go to Korea and get away from her. Uh, we were still 18 at the time, and we didn't know how to be a, a cohesive family unit. Uh, I didn't have any help from my family, from my parents. She didn't have much help from her family. Her mom would come by every now and again. Uh, so I went to Korea. In Korea, we call that America's Second Army, where they can't hear you scream. And the reason why is because what they can do to you in Korea, they cannot do to you back in the States. Um, and that was my first bout with racial injustice on my end and it was detrimental to me. Uh, so special forces came into town and they were looking for a few good men. And so I volunteered. Uh, my chain of command thought it was stupid because there's no way I, as a little boy, pretty much could amount to anything in special forces. So I went out for special forces assessment and selection and made the cut. Uh, fast forward a couple years later, I ended up getting deployed to Iraq. I sustained a shrapnel injury to my left eye. Um, had my cornea shredded, lost most of the vision in my left eye, 
was medevaced to Kuwait, where I had my first surgery down there, and then sent to Germany. While I'm in Germany, <laughs> the uh, ophthalmologist looked at me, and, she, and he said that they did not uh, suture you well, so we have to go back and redo that. And so I'm thinking, cool, I'm going to have another surgery, everything's going to be great. And so he clears off his desk and says, how's your pain tolerance? And I'm like, it's pretty good, I'm pretty hardcore, pretty stoic. So he said, I need you to open your eye, keep it open, and I'm going to suture you right here on the table. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, it actually didn't hurt. It was, there was like crunching sounds, but like other, other than that, it was, it was pretty good. <laughs> it, it didn't really hurt that much. Uh, so overnight, my military career was taken from me, and I became a family man. And I have never really been a family man. In the military, family is important, but it's secondary. The mission comes first. Your training comes first. Uh, people think that just because you served in the military that you are ready to combat anything like rose at you, and that's far from the truth. In reality, they don't teach you how to deal with going back into that civilian sector. So I entered what I like to call the dark days of my life. I had a post-traumatic stress syndrome, had it pretty bad for about six years. And it's akin to imagining somebody being in a coma for that long. Time goes on, my kids got older, and I was not present for any of it. I was physically there, but mentally and emotionally, I had totally checked out. Right, actually, let's skip this up. Uh, <laughs> and when I awoke April Fool's Day, which is also my favorite day, by the way, uh, April Fool's Day 2009, I decided, hey, I'm going to be 30 in two months, and I need this to end. So first day, I take my kids to the park. They're super shocked because they're like, Dad hasn't left the house except to like go to school and whatnot, and here he is taking us to the park. And just by chance, I saw a group of guys there playing soccer, and I asked him if I could, how I could be involved, because I used to play soccer. Uh, I played against the Korean national team, the Iraqi national team, while, while I served in the Army. Um, it was pretty decent at soccer. And so uh, they let me join their team. They were really instrumental in helping me get out the house more. Um, and so at this time, while I was going through this PTSD, trauma. My wife at the time, we're since divorced, uh, I needed help from her. I needed her to be on my team, but I didn't know how to ask her to be on my team. I, and she wanted to be on my team and she wanted to help me, but she didn't know what she needed to do. And because communication wasn't where it needed to be, that ultimately led to the downfall of our uh, marriage. Because once I snapped out of this whole PTSD thing, she was on one side of the fence and I was on the other. So, um, and to her credit, and I will give her all the credit in the world, she held our family together while I was just incapacitated. Fortunately for me, if you know anything about PTSD, uh, there's multiple ways an individual can uh, go through that. You can become violent, you can uh, turn to drugs and alcohol, uh, you can uh, be promiscuous, if you will, and I just became a hermit. I didn't go anywhere, I didn't do anything. Um, World of Warcraft had come out at this time, <laughs> and I became firmly ensconced in this video game. Why? Because it allowed me to once again lead people in combat situations, and that became my life. Um, it was, going back and looking at it now, I, I'm glad I, I did go through that, but I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It's not worth it, especially when you have to go through it by yourself. So if anybody knows anybody with PTSD, please try your best to help them, join their team, pull them into your team, whatever, need, whatever you need to do to kind of help them get out of that negative state that they're in. So going back to finding these guys who were playing soccer, I had the, you know, one of those first original iPods with the, the big wheel, they were like super huge, like bricks, and so I wanted to download music. So I go to YouTube, I type in West Coast, my finger hits S, so Swing fills out the rest. I'm like, I don't know what that is, so I clicked on it and there was this couple dancing. And I'm like, oh my God. That's amazing. I don't know how to dance, but I would like to learn how to do that. Um, growing up, all my family members had rhythm. I was the black sheep of the black family because I had no rhythm. So at that point, I looked online, and we were living in Indianapolis at the time. Where could I learn to do this? They had a class the next day. I said, too soon. Gave myself about six months to work up the courage to go. And then January 2010, I went. So I affectionately called this group Team Indy, Team Indianapolis. Uh, they were instrumental in helping me get out the house, travel, see the world, um, or see more of the country at that time. Um, 
they had told me that there were these levels. There was novice and intermediate and advanced and all-star and champion, and you could travel around as a professional dancer. And at the time, I was working in surgery at uh, IU University Hospital. And so around 2012, I decided, I think I'm done with this, and I want to travel, and I want to be a professional dancer. I had no idea how I was going to do this. Um, my team, if you will, supported me in my endeavor. As the years have gone on, we've since disbanded. Uh, several of them still dance, most of them don't. They started families or moved on into their own personal careers. Uh, another picture of the guys at Team Indy. Um, and it was a really great time for me. I really enjoyed that time looking back. Um, I wouldn't be here had it not been for that beginning uh, group right there. So I decided in order for me to become a professional dancer, I needed better dancing. I needed to go where there was more dancing. And in Indianapolis, we danced about four times a month. And I heard in Chicago, a mere three and a half hours to the north, they did more dancing. So I show up to Chicago, and I start dancing, and then people want lessons, and I start teaching. Um, and this is me here my first uh, West Coast Swing competition, Chicago Classic 2010. I'm just a baby novice person. And I actually messaged her today to let her know, hey, you're going to be in my TED Talk. And uh, so she was super happy. Um, and my, my career started, as far as competition-wise, here. 95 guys, I got fifth place, and I realized, hey, I can do this. So I go to Chicago, and I meet this interesting host of people. Um, they were instrumental in making me the man I am today. They were part of that equation. They were part of that team. And going back to that superhero team, what I realized is if you understand, like, the Avengers or the Justice League, Yes, they have a Superman, they have an Iron Man, they have a Thor, you know, they have all these super-powered individuals, but at no time is one person the absolute dictator. So there's been times, and I'll get into that here in a minute, where sometimes the smallest person on my team has been that Superman or that Superwoman. Uh, and everybody just kind of takes turns, um, which I have found that to be hugely instrumental in helping people combat what happens to us in our day-to-day -day life, our ups and downs. So I met this group here, and I said I was going to do it, so I'm going to do it. Right? So we were here in Florida at a uh, New Year's dance event, and this is the lady I affectionately call Little Puppy. She's here conducting us. We're doing karaoke. Never done karaoke before in my life. Didn't want to, but she's actually pretty awesome at it. So if you ever have a chance to hear her sing, that'd be super awesome. Um, and so here we, uh, we had a group Halloween contest at Swing City Chicago last year. Uh, we were all dominoes, and we all lined up, and we fell down like dominoes. That was pretty cool. We won the award. This is a group here at uh, West Coast Wednesdays here in Down Earth Road. And all these people, uh, we in the dance world, we call them dance family, you know, our dance family. And they have been instrumental in helping me uh, get to where I'm, I'm at. Uh, so when I moved to Chicago, I met a woman, fell in love, and learned truly how to love for the first time, absolutely and deeply. Unfortunately, last year was the worst year of my life as that relationship had dissolved, went up in flames, and I was just devastated. And I, you know, when you go through heartache, I do believe that everyone should experience that at some point in their life. That was my first time doing it at the tender age of 37, and uh, it, was, it was pretty hard for me. But fortunately, I had a, my team rose ranks uh, around me and helped me get through that time. It, it was also great for my, my sons. They have never seen me cry, and I was just tears galore. Um, I had several of my friends come over to my house, and they brought me food, and I couldn't eat it, and I'm sitting there crying into my food. And to me, that was the lowest of the low, but it was also a beautiful moment at that time. Because uh, they say in order to grow, the accelerants for growth are openness and vulnerability, and that's something I had always struggled with. I was never really open, and nor did I want to be vulnerable. And so at this time, Clearly crying, the ugly cry, the snot, everything. And uh, they didn't judge me, and they helped me out of that horrible time period. Um, and so in 2015, <laughs> I joined CrossFit. This here is our mascot, Eddie. This is Doghouse CrossFit here in Chicago. And this is probably my favorite place on earth. I enjoy being here. There's no place I'd really rather be. When I travel, I make sure I can schedule my travel so when I fly back, I can go home, put my bags down, and go immediately to this place. Um, they're also on my team. They've also accepted me for who I am and what I am. And with these individuals here, it's like a family, a brotherhood, a sisterhood of the iron, where 
Uh, ordinary people come here to learn how to do extraordinary things. Weights that you didn't think you could lift, etc. And they've been instrumental, again, in helping me build my team and helping me get through life. Um, here's some more pictures of the family. So, this man right here, Robert Royston, he is a, legend, a living legend in our dance. Uh, he started uh, couples dancing in 1989. He is a uh, world country champion, uh, U.S. Open West Coast Swing champion. He's won cabaret. He's done Broadway productions. He's produced and danced and did choreography for Love and Dancing. He did choreography and appeared in uh, Dance With Me. He did choreography for uh, Crank 2 High Voltage, Million Dollar Baby. He's been, uh, he's performed for the Tony Awards. I mean, he's, you name it, he's done it all. So one year, I want to say it was like 2014, I was at a West Coast Swing event and I posted on Facebook, hey, I'm going to the gym to work out. Anybody want to join me? So he shows up and we quickly make a bond. You know, we're working out, talking, and we've been friends ever since. So last year, as a West Coast Swing instructor, uh, I also have a background in anatomy and physiology and kinesiology and also personal training. So I decided to marry all of that with my West Coast Swing, and thus Mumfurious Movement was born. And basically, it's a program I've, dissolved, I've, uh, I've formed where, which helps people understand their movement and mobility limitations. We address that. I give them a protocol in which to help correct all those issues so that they can go through life as pain-free as possible. If you're a dancer and you can't achieve the level of dancing you want, chances are it's not so much the technique, is that your body is not doing what you need it to do. So let's go and fix that. So I asked this man here if he would like to join with me or if I could join with him, because he's, you know, he's all around the world teaching, and, and he said yes. So this year we got to teach together for the very first time. That was an awesome experience. Here's us at one of the gyms at uh, one of the, the dance events, and I'm helping him with his shoulder mobility. Um, and in 2014 as well, I knew I wanted to travel overseas. And in order to do that, I had to have a plan. And as of 2017, I just came back from Ukraine on Wednesday, teaching over there, and it was an amazing experience. I got to meet people I've never, I never thought I would ever meet before. I enjoyed myself so much, I will be going back in two weeks. Um, here is some of the Ukrainian individuals here. Also, in June, I partnered up with Amos, a ministry of sharing. I will be going down to Nicaragua to help the um, uh, health educators down there teach their patients how to go about fixing their mobility so that they can move through life unencumbered, as unencumbered as possible. Um, all of these things have kind of helped me become the person I am today. And if there's anything that you can take from this conversation, please do your best to present yourself to the world in as positive a manner and a, and a light as, positive, or as possible. Because at that point, when you need a team, a team will arise around you. Thank you very much.